This podcast is a quest for well-being, a quest for a meaningful life through the exploration of fundamental truths, enlightening ideas, insights on physical, mental, and spiritual health. The inspiration is love. The aspiration is to awaken new ways of thinking that can lead us to a new way of being, being well. Welcome to Body, Mind, and Soul Healing Conversations. Together, we are the product of broken hearts and the brave decision to return to love. Love from the Vortex and other poems, Kaleidoscope Vibrations, LLC, is poet and scholar activist Yolanda Seeley Ruiz's first full-length collection, an archaeological exploration on love and intimacy. The book charts her journey of finding and losing love over the span of three decades with six different men who came into her life and at various times, but also offers a universal take on what can happen when one seeks love and connection with others and the lessons that follow when that connection and love is lost. Revealing moments of happiness, fantasy, frustration, and eventually dealing with the dissolution of relationships, the book moves beyond these anticipated stages to moments of grace and beauty that come with the discovery and practice of self-love and a more fuller understanding of what it means to truly love someone as you love yourself. Valeria Telles interviews Yolanda Seeley Ruiz, the author of Love from the Vortex and Other Poems. Yolanda Seeley Ruiz is an award-winning associate professor at Teachers College, Columbia University. Her research focuses on racial literacy in teacher education, Black girl literacies, and Black and Latinx male high school students. A sought-after speaker on issues of race, culturally responsive pedagogy, and diversity, Seely Ruiz works with K-12 and higher education school communities to increase their racial literacy knowledge and move toward more equitable school experiences for their Black and Latinx students. Seely Ruiz appeared in Spike Lee's Two Fists Up, We Gonna Be Alright, a documentary about the Black Lives Matter movement and the campus protest at Mizzou. Her first full-length book of poetry, Love from the Vortex and Other Poems, an archaeological dig on love and intimacy, was released in March 2020 by Kaleidoscope Vibrations. Meet Yolanda at YolandaSeelyRuiz.com. Here is the interview with Yolanda Seely Ruiz. In your own words, who is Yolanda Silly Ruiz? Yolanda Silly Ruiz is a woman who has recently learned to be free, a woman who has recently learned she is content, and a woman who is very grounded in what she wants to see in the world, and that is equity, that is love, that is equality. And so everything that I do in my work life or whatever I do in my personal life intersects with those items and those ideas. And speaking of freedom, you write, I was set free because I let go. This is a powerful phrase, a powerful insight or statement to make. Talk to me for a moment about freedom. What is the meaning of freedom to you? What is to be free? Um, It's absolutely a letting go. And uh, for those folks who meditate, and I know there are different traditions uh, of meditation, but one thing we learn as those who are invested in meditation or whatever tradition, that there are things that you cannot control. 
that the releasing of things to allow flow is, is how we must live in order to have peace. And so for me, the idea of freedom is to understand when you let go, things will flow in the natural way that they are supposed to. That for me is freedom. Now, freedom in terms of my my background, my people, I identify myself as Black American, um, very much interested in the freedom of my people. And when I say that, freedom that allows us to live to our fullest capacity, uh, freedom to be educated in the way that you desire, to be eligible for jobs and housing in the way that you desire and that you need. And so we know, or at least I know specifically in America and traditionally our history of 400 years, those who look like me, that we have been fighting for freedom and we continue to do so. And so when you ask that very powerful question, it is both on a personal level, what do I need to be free? My mind to be free, my heart, my spirit to be free. But I'm also engaged in the fight for freedom on a political level. Uh, which is also spiritual and emotional for people who look like me. Can you expand for a moment about that? So where are we with the, uh, yeah, this movement? Mm -hmm. That's a beautiful question. And I want to think about what Sister Angela Davis said, who, if you follow her history, you know that she has seen some things. She's had the federal government literally wanting to kill her. Uh, She spent decades sort of dodging and running while she was also standing firm and standing up. And when George Floyd was murdered this past summer and brothers and sisters from all over the world, Finland, Korea, Japan, uh, Brazil, Israel, were saying Black Lives Matter, she said that she had not, she'd seen a lot, but she'd not seen that. And what has continued to happen as, particularly in the US, as we see things unfold. We recently put in a a new president, but we've seen um, loud and clear some of the anger, the hate, quite frankly, the disgruntledness that a lot of people hold. And so that has awakened a segment of our population, whereas before they were not comfortable or familiar uh, with talking about these issues that the movement has been taking up for decades. And so on our television, uh, on our, regardless of your political leanings, the the, uh, newscasters, we're talking openly about racial injustice, whatever your political leaning is. That's new. True. So So since that is new, it is shifting the conversation within academic institutions, within businesses, within school systems, within the court system. And so where we are in the movement is finally, I think, beginning to have honest conversations. And Bell Hooks tells us that honesty is the beginning of trust. Trust is the beginning of love, right? And so to answer your question, I think we are at the cusp of having some open conversations that possibly we can move towards the love of full humanity and for all of us, Mm -hmm. not just based on skin color or socioeconomics or religion, which is really how this country has been stratified. Do you think that this separation perspective comes from fear? Yes. And I love that you said that earlier, even before we started recording, because when I do work, as I will this afternoon with a school district, I try to address based on the thousands of people that I've spoken with. You know, I've been teaching for 29 years. I've done this type of work literally with thousands of people across the globe and abroad. And um, I talk about the things that prevent us from being fully human with ourselves or prevent us from fully embracing the humanity of others and shunning racism and all of these stereotypes and biases that we hold. And fear is a major component. The ego is another. And the two of them together uh, can be quite frightening because with the ego, you believe that your position, where you are, your values, your position, your way of being is the correct way. There's no other way, right? That's the first thing. And fear begins to creep in because when someone asks you to be open, to shift from that or to see another perspective, to take in another story, to look at history, if you will, people are often afraid that what if I do open up to that and I find that what I've been believing 
And what I've been doing all my life is something that is both not just dehumanizing, but something that is wrong and out of sync with history. So there's the fear of losing the very foundation on which you stand. And so people will protect that at any cost because folks want to be right, but folks also are afraid of change. Because if I do listen to this and learn this and change my perspectives, what about all of the people around me? And if I begin to change, there's the fear that I might lose those friendships or those relationships, which often happens. So it's almost, uh, and I don't take light on suicide at all. I, I have it, people in my family have I've taken that path, but it's almost tantamount to the killing off of oneself as you know it. Mm. Right. And really being afraid because you don't know what's on the other side of it. So you are so right on about fear mm-hmm. and it paralyzes people. You wrote the book, Love from the Vortex and Other Poems. I have three questions for you uh, initially. How did you become a writer and what was the inspiration, intention and purpose of writing this book? Mm, beautiful question. I have been writing um probably since I was about 12 or 13, and specifically writing poetry, I remember being 15. And it really was a utility more than anything else, because I grew up in a home, my father was very violent. And um, writing the poetry allowed me to take on other characters, take on other voices. I also wrote short stories uh, to write a different reality for myself, right? So I was very clear at a very young age that I was using my writing as a utility. And that was to uh, dream a different way. Mm -hmm. And that has stayed with me through relationships, through my marriage. Um, I write to free and heal myself. That's the opening uh, quote of the book, because it is true. I write to understand myself, to make sense. And so that's how I've always used writing. And I never called myself a writer and certainly didn't call myself a poet uh-huh. until 2018. And it wasn't that I needed an institution to sanction that for me. But when uh-huh. I was invited to write an inaugural poem for the new president of Teachers College, Columbia University, something that no one had ever done. This was something new. Um, I didn't know what that meant. So I called on my, of course, poet ancestors. I looked at Maya Angelou and the poems that she wrote for uh, Clinton, for Obama, and uh, I waited for the inspiration. And that's when I knew that it was something different, right? Because not everyone was processing the world or waiting for inspiration. (laughs) I, I knew that that was something different. So I would have to say 2018 is when I officially called myself a poet but I've been writing since I was 15, really writing all my life. Yeah, I love, absolutely love writing. And I do connect writing to healing. It's yes. so healing. Speaking of healing, what is healing to you? Do you believe in a destination per se, being healed? Mm, you know, what an incredible question. I have been using Um, I I think destination in terms of the healing project that's before us, I think healing is ongoing. I think as long as we're living and we're living with others, there's always the possibility of being hurt, of being harmed. I think we can do self-harm as well. And so to answer the question, it is, is both and. I think that, and I have been healed. Like I think about these relationships in the book. Um, very painful journey, but I have been healed, meaning I can speak to the person and know that I'm okay with them. I don't have any more anger. I don't have any of that. Um, But healing is a continual process because there might be something that might open up or we say trigger something. And because I have uh, learned how to treat myself, soothe myself, understand myself, I can deal with it. I still have this healing that I've experienced, but the wounds can sometimes be agitated. My other question is about love. So how many kinds of love have you come to live, experience, and understand? Wow. You know, we could go to the traditional, and I don't remember all of them. I remember growing up, eros, agape, And there's another type of love, right? Growing up in school and you learn about the Greek traditions. I've come to understand self-love. 
Mm-hmm. I've come to understand um, after losing children to three miscarriages and finally having a child, I've come to understand unconditional love truly yeah. for another human being that if I had to give my life, I, I can understand that I would find the courage to give it for my child. That was new for me. Yeah. And I only experienced that by becoming a mother. So I've, I've learned that love. I've learned the love of uh, sacrifice. My mom also lives with me. And so I have been uh, taking care of her. She, I guess she's been taking care of me too for over 20 years. Wow. And so uh, there's a love of sacrifice. But because of the self-love that I've learned, I've also learned that there are boundaries and that there's a way to love boundaries. So I guess I'm, I guess I'm talking about learning me, loving me, loving others, but also loving ideas and ways to increase my own self-love and to increase the love that I have for others. So the love, that that's something that is... Uh, I'm still learning that's ongoing. And most recently in my research, I'm investigating and learning this idea of critical love, love that is attached to the freedom. Uh, And I'm talking here in the political sense, when I talk Mm -hmm. to teachers to free themselves of the stereotypes and the biases that they hold about their students and their communities. And then for them to be able to invite their students into a critical love so that they too may be free of the biases and the stereotypes that the society holds about them. So this idea of critical or the criticality of it is connected to, you know, race, class, gender, all of these constructions that have been created by society that we often don't talk about. So taking that critical love, a critical view of what impacts love and how love needs to look in certain settings in the case of schools, critical love is really important uh, for me for that. It's still new to me, as I said before, the separation. I don't, intellectually, I don't understand. It's really something, my heart completely, completely doesn't understand that. <laughs> but intellectually, too. It's illogical. It's racism. Right, it's illogical. Right, Yolanda. That's, that's it, yeah. So I cannot even conceive that idea, the, the perspective. What do you think is the purpose of the human experience? purpose of the human experience, perhaps to make um, our lives and the lives of others livable and livable in the sense of how can we reach our fullest potential uh, within this life and how can I use my life to facilitate that for someone else and how can I enjoy that journey as well, even through the pain and the discomfort and all that life offers and brings I think it's it's really about being here to understand ourselves more, to have some sort of knowledge of the world around us, and to encourage others in the pursuit of their full humanity. Mm, I really yes. believe that. And I've never been asked that question before. And so I thank you because I have all of these, clearly these thoughts inside of me. And until you're asked, this is part of the human experience too, right? This podcast, this conversation of you helping me excavate how I feel about these issues and to be able to voice them is allowing me to vibrate on a level that is higher. Do you have any spiritual practices? Do you consider yourself to be a spiritual, although to me, everything is spiritual, but spiritual person in the sense of practices, engaging in spiritual practices? Well, I'll I'll say this, that I was raised all my life with religious practices, right? And so the root of of my religious understandings is Christianity, right? And and what that brings. One of my best friends is um, Muslim. And so as we deepen our friendship, she shares with me things from her faith. And as I have gotten more into meditation, in looking into Buddhist principles and philosophies. I find that that speaks very much to the type of world that I uh, desire to see. Christianity hasn't gotten us there. Uh, Islam hasn't gotten us there. Oftentimes it's so connected to war and to power and believing this way, right, to, to, to be the right way. 
But with spirituality, that is the full, for me, the openness of humanity. How do we work and be together? How do I go to a higher level and and you go to a higher level and we do this together? So I would say both that uh, I am spiritual and the religious part, prayer is very important to me too, which is very much like meditation. So I find that those pieces of my religion that are going to help me see the full humanity and try to live the full humanity of people. And I know it's not about like a smorgasbord where you pick and you choose. But if we're going to be honest, there are some severe limitations to the way religion has been played out by humans that uh, often causes pain. Not so much I've seen with spirituality, not so much with mindfulness and really looking at the human spirit versus the human body your color, your gender, your sexual orientation. I think religion has been very limited in that way in terms of how I see human beings. Your book, there are so many poems and passages that caught my attention. I absolutely love the one you call Commitment. I know that I am ready to love you because I am prepared to lose you. This is a very powerful statement inside something to express. So I'm wondering if, do you still feel and um, live this way? In a sense, is this something that's practical that we can all somehow embody? Yes, you have to build your heart for it. You definitely (laughs) have to build your heart up for it. Yes, it is the way that I feel I must live. And it's connected to our conversation when we talked about freedom. And I know how I want to live freely. And I want to love someone um, where they have the freedom to leave um, if they feel that they must leave. Because if this love is no longer serving them, no matter how much I desire it, I have to understand it as another human being, they have the right to go. And so for me, it doesn't restrict me from loving openly, but I always love knowing with the possibility that as soon as I feel that deeply, that it is a possibility that they may go. And so I have to be willing to hold on to the love, but also not hold on to the love, to enjoy it as it is there, but be ready to uh, release it when it is gone. And for me, that is my ultimate way of knowing that I love someone because I want for them what I want for myself, which is freedom. That really resonates as someone who really knows who she is, right? The depth of life. I love this here, the inner me. You say, Of all the marvelous people in the world to meet, it is you I am most interested in knowing. Yes. (laughs) Yourself. (laughs) What are the signs that perhaps people who have not reached your level of understanding of self would know that we are getting to know ourselves? Are there some specific signs? Mm, You you know, I'm going to answer this by saying when you recognize the signs that are not of uh, self-knowledge, a lot of dependency. Honestly, I was in a lot of these relationships and I knew that I wasn't serving myself. Like I knew when I was giving and I am an open giving person, but I knew when it was too much because it was depleting. I knew I felt I was, oh my gosh, I hope he texts. I hope he calls. That I was putting all of that energy, right? Instead of doing the things that I needed to do in my life, it could have been something very practical, like handling a work thing. Right. But mm-hmm. I was just obsessing and just so focused. And then, you know, ignoring the signs that we see that not so much that the person is where you are. I think it's almost impossible yeah. for us yeah. to be with someone that's at this same level of right. love. True. Uh, But if that person is working, is open towards it, exploring themselves, being vulnerable, you know, I can work with that. But to be honest, a lot of these men, they were not doing the self-work. I couldn't have these kinds of conversations. So I guess the answer to that question is, if we need to have this deep humility and honesty, you know when you are short shrifting yourself. You know when you are putting people in front of you to the point that is actually detrimental to your emotional health. So if there's a way to recognize that, 
And I, I want to encourage therapy. I want to encourage us really digging deep into our childhoods and past relationships. That's how it happened for me. When you can see it, then you can interrupt it. I think that's the first phase. Then the second phase will begin to practice it until it becomes habit, right? So there's no one way. It's different for all of us. We all have different things to, I don't even want to say overcome, to manage, to accept, to understand about ourselves that prevents us really from that type of self-knowledge and love. And I want to go back to you and I want to say a lot of it is fear because, you know, some people are afraid to be alone yeah. because they have to truly face themselves. Yes. That's one, getting to know themselves and then getting to love oneself, regardless of what you have done and what you find there, the darkness. And what's done to you, because a lot of the darkness comes mm. from doing things to us in our childhood when we have no control or in a different type of vulnerable phase or stage of our lives where we didn't realize what was happening. And some people can see and sense vulnerability and whatever happened to them either allows them to cradle it or to abuse it. I absolutely love the awakening poem to, uh, oh, I love the eternal hope, <laughs> speaking from that place. I mean, you made me laugh, cry, everything, but all these emotions, which is a beautiful thing, isn't it? Human beings, we have this ability to feel all these um, different feelings. <laughs> um, so before I ask you those final questions, would you like to add anything or read one of your poems? Um, I would love to read something short, but also mention that there's an audible version. I call it an audible album that will be uh, launching soon um, from this moment of the podcast, whatever date uh, this airs, it'll be um, launching soon. And I'm super excited because all of the poems are read by me. They are set to original um, music, uh, set to sound and engineered and produced by a, a Grammy Award, no, a Grammy nominated uh, guitarist. And um, it was just a beautiful experience. And I call it an audible album because it really is musically focused. Oh, so I just wanted to share that. And the, the poem that I want to read is Just Us. Okay. That is a combination of both you know, romantic love, but also love for uh, this kind of political equity yeah. And, yeah. and rights for all humans. Yes, yeah, wonderful. It also positions me where I, I want to, how I want to live my life and to be a good ancestor. Just us. Here is my invitation for you to bend towards justice. My arc of self bends in favor of love. Asking hard questions and waiting for answers that don't offer conclusions, just more wonderings about how to live a life worthy of the children who come after us. So thank you for that. It's, it's both being a good ancestor, connecting to the ancestral world, but also the future world, but understanding my role in the present to be able to negotiate those two worlds. Thank you so much for what you do. Thank you for the being aware of your purpose, your beautiful work, and um, everything else in between. So I have two more questions. Those are the ending questions. If you knew you would die soon, meaning losing the body, would you make any change in your life or do anything in a different way? Mm, I'm going to say I'm learning to do that. And, and that would be, if you asked me that six months ago, I would say be more fully present with my daughter, more fully present with my mom. And I've been making gains on that. So I feel that I'm doing that. One thing I may want to change is uh, maybe talking to my sister a little bit more. You know, our lives are so busy and she calls my mom every day and, you know, maybe making time for her and, and perhaps my brother. So from a carnal perspective, those who are part of my biological family, spending a bit more time speaking with them, Although I do feel like I'm making the change toward being more fully present with my daughter and my mom. So I'm grateful for that. But I, I have no regrets. I feel my life is being lived as it is supposed to be lived. And I'm trying to vibrate to the highest level with the work that I do. And I'm satisfied. I'm content. Hey, that was a reminder for me, too. I just thought about my sister. Yeah, talking to her more, right? My last question. What are three things about life you know for sure as of this moment? 
I know that we all have to pass to another life. It, that life ends. I know that. I know that you can't have tomorrow back. I mean, yesterday back. You cannot have yesterday back. This life as we know it is going to end. And I know that happiness is within and not something that another individual can give you, nor are they responsible mm. for giving it to you. They can enhance it, but it is not their job to make you happy. Those are the things I know for sure. Thank you so much again, Yolanda, for your presence and your beautiful, authentic presence. And we'll talk some for sure. Thank you. I wanted to give honor and thanks to you for having this beautiful work in the world and for spending this time with me. So it, I'm, I'm in a space of gratitude with you. Where can we find more information about you, your books, products, services, and future projects? Awesome. YolandaSealyRuiz.com. That's my website. Please also visit with me on Twitter at Ruiz Sealy. Also on IG, Yoli underscore Sealy Ruiz or Ruiz. You know, it's pronounced either way. And let's start with that. And, you know, a, a simple Google search, I pop up. Um, please look for the Audible. That is a search on Amazon between now and a month from now, the Audible album will be up. And I'm open to hearing people's stories and how the work has impacted them. So feel free to email me, which is also easily found with a simple Google search with Yolanda Sealy Ruiz as my name. Wonderful. Thank you so much again, Yolanda, and we'll talk soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you for listening. To learn more about Yolanda Seely Ruiz and her work, please visit YolandaSeelyRuiz.com. To learn more about this podcast, please visit fitforjoy.org slash podcast. Thank you again for listening and bye for now.